broadcast the show into the new era this year when BHP became the first major sponsor to be given naming rights for the show. It was a recognition of the commercial potential of the show, which draws larger crowds than any other event in the region. The Shortland County Council was eager to become part of the success story, and today Chairman John Jobling handed over $20,000 to show President Clem Varley. While the big-time sponsorship is good news for the show, it's also significant for the County Council, which is about to have a change of logo, image and name. Next month, the authority will be renamed Shortland Electricity and begin an aggressive advertising campaign to woo the energy consumer's dollar. If we don't promote, we'll lose sales, the prices will go up, we'll lose jobs and we'll go out of existence. That, I think, was last year and last century's thinking. We're going to be aggressive out there in the market and merchandise. And that's what we're doing and that's why we're here sponsoring the biggest event in Newcastle, the Newcastle Show. Total confirmed sponsorship for next year's show is already $70,000 and President Clem Varley is confident more sponsors will join in to push the total past $100,000 for the fourth year in succession. New features include the City of Newcastle Art Prize and a wine and food fair, but Mr Varley says it will be a back to basics show. Well our intention for 1987 show is to broaden the basis of Newcastle show and perhaps to take it a little bit back to the more traditional areas of, uh, of shows and education, farm education, uh, taking us back to some of the more traditional areas of Newcastle show, along with, of course, the usual razzmatazz that the show has become famous for. The Shortland County Council John right. Dobling yesterday presented a cheque for $30,000 to show President Clem Varley. The County Council is about to move into a new era with a change of image. Changing the Council's name to Shortland Electricity and the creation of a new logo is just part of that change. Sponsoring the show, which draws the largest crowd of any event in the region, will herald an aggressive move into an area of merchandising and promotion not seen before by the Shortland County Council. We're going to be aggressive out there in the market and merchandise and that's what we're doing and that's why we're here sponsoring the biggest event in Newcastle, the Newcastle Show. A fortnight ago, Mrs Brittendorf was approached in the backyard of her neat but weather-worn little Edward Street home by a man. What he was offering was to paint the outside of her house with free coats for the price of $750 with an extra $300 on top for the guttering. Mrs Mittendorf accepted the verbal agreement and the next day the man turned up in a South Australian registered Ford Bronco to roughly sand back the weatherboards. His accomplices in a Queensland registered sedan arrived the following day and a single coat of paint was quickly sprayed over the entire house and a few other things as well. The man then asked for the money, plus another $700 for the addition of a sealer to the paint to make it stick, which Mrs Mittendorf says she repeatedly told him she did not want and could not afford. But feeling intimidated, she paid up. Now the Department of Consumer Affairs says there's nothing it can do about the matter because nothing was written down. If someone approaches you offering to paint your house, well, they could be quite genuine. But in Mrs Mittendorf's case, obviously they weren't. The lesson here is to insist on a written contract which details the work to be done and the agreed price. And don't pay up until you're satisfied the work's been done properly. Otherwise, you could end up in the same situation as Mrs Mittendorf. I can't do nothing better, can you? Now it's been done. I can't do anything about it now. He's been paid. And he's disappeared? Yeah. To explain. One thousand hundred members of the Australian Bank Employees Union have been chosen to lead the charge against management in the battle over who puts the fringe benefits bill. 
The union says that the government intended the banks to pay the tax, and in pure economic terms, the banks are better equipped to do so. It says the bank's net profit per employee last year was $9,000, and when it's taken into account that the average weekly bank employee's wage is only $17,000, it seems unfair to pass the burden on to the workers. If the fringe benefits tax is passed on, it will mean an average increase each year of $144 in credit card charges and $720 in housing loans. State Secretary of the Union, Dawson Peaty. But it's not a fight with the bank's customers and we uh, want to inconvenience them as least we can. Uh, but at the same time we want to send a very clear message to bank management that uh, the staff are upset and uh, certainly the reaction we've had over the last couple of days uh, is that they are very angry about their employers' actions. Standing room only at the Hexham Bowling Club as a panel of politicians and four-wheel drive officials led a discussion on the proposed Wilderness and Wild Rivers Act. The Minister for Environment and Planning, Bob Carr, has extended the deadline for submissions on this most controversial act until early December. Last Friday was to be the closing day for public comment. The four-wheel drivers say the legislation, if passed, will deny peaceful access by thousands of New South Wales citizens to our natural heritage. The land use officer for the New South Wales Four-Wheel Drive Association, John Gregg, in addressing the meeting, also contended that the closure of the current parklands will place a further burden on those remaining open. Mr Gregg says the association has drafted a thorough, hard-hitting, 100-page submission to be put before the minister. So we're pointing out to him what the four-wheel drive clubs are all about. We've done a profile of the average member through surveys. We've looked at the economic impact of uh, four-wheel driving and we've looked in detail at the, at the report itself, the report of the Wilderness Working Group, and we've made certain conclusions from all that and made certain recommendations to him. Those recommendations include spreading the impact of use by extending access, not locking areas up as proposed, educating recreational users of wilderness areas through public campaigns, and the formation of a structured use management plan to preserve and maintain the areas in question. The Minister for Agriculture and Lands, Jack Hallam, last week approved the creation of two new flora reserves in the Barrington Tops area. Rainforest, dominated by the rare Negro Head Beach in the Paddy's Brush area to the west of Gloucester, will now be made a flora reserve, as will an area to the north of Dungog at Jerusalem Creek. 60 hectares of coachwood will be preserved there. These two areas will now be accorded the same degree of statutory protection as a national park, with only an act of parliament able to repeal their designation. again today. Enemy or Orange forces charged with the task of attacking the base were F-111s from Amberley in Queensland, Skyport from New Zealand Air Force, and the Air Force from from Richmond. Commander of the enemy force is Wing Commander Frank Sharp from the New Zealand Air Force. Well, uh, from our point of view, uh, we fly the Skyhawk, which is an attack aircraft, and so it's ideal opportunity, an ideal opportunity for us to uh, do just that, practice realistic attacks and see whether we how effective we are at getting through the uh, air defence cap lines. The exercise is a three-day air defence exercise aimed at testing William Town's air defence capabilities against a variety of attacks. Ideally, aircraft on their way to attack William Town are picked up on long-range radar. Then friendly forces are scrambled to intercept them before they enter William Town to attack. Defending forces, perhaps more force, the based at William Town. And although weather conditions at the base are difficult, according to Exercise Controller Wing Commander Ron McGrath, they are coping. Well, we're gusting to about 35 knots, uh, but that's well within the limitations of the aeroplanes that we're operating at the present moment. Fortunately, the wind is just about down the runway. Uh, if it swings around to the southwest a little, we may have one or two problems.
500 delegates are attending this year's annual convention, the first to be held in Newcastle for five years. District Governor John Kilpatrick says, as well as carrying a theme of peace, the convention has already put forward plans for two bicentennial projects. We're going to raise $200,000 for health care projects and uh, we've already helped a lot of the hospitals in our area through that fund and uh, a second one we hope to put together uh, libraries of Australian and historical books for every school in the whole of our district from Woi Woi to Gloucester to Mary Warscone and uh, remembering the bicentenary as uh, the next 200 years rather than the last 200 years. About 200 people have gathered here in Civic Park today to protest about changes to the Workers' Compensation and Third Party Acts. The people are particularly cross at changes which would prevent them from taking their claims in a lump sum. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. Daryl Summers was rehearsing with the Alan Ward Orchestra this afternoon in preparation for tonight's Star Spangled Show. The awards will once again feature Tommy Tico on piano, as well as juggling comedian Marty Coffey and Star Search winner Billy Wilde. Local talent is competing for a dozen awards, including the Alan Brooking Encouragement Award and the Star Music Award, won last year by rock band DB8. As for Daryl Summers, although he's better known for his comedy television work, he is also an experienced singer, tap dancer and drummer. As such, he's particularly interested in encouraging young talent. How important are awards like this to young musicians uh, and performers starting out? I think they're, they're a form of encouragement and that's all that's, that's necessary. If, if someone takes off an award or trains for an award and they, even if they come second, I think, well, that's better than coming third or fourth. So it really encourages uh, and spreads the word of, of music around and that's the main, I think, the essence of it. It was a full house for the Star Awards, which are now recognised as being by far the most important awards in the local music industry. The master of ceremonies was Daryl Summers, and he had a star that included Tommy Tico, duetting on piano with his daughter Vicky. The awards received a record number of entries this year. In the songwriting categories alone, entries were tripled. Amongst the awards, DB8 were voted the best heavy rock band. Vegemite Reggae were the best light rock band. Best jazz band went to the Roaring Horns. And Kentucky Moonshine were the best country so band. Western that, Suburbs Licks Once Club Band the won the best Thank club you. band. And Jab won both the best cabaret band and best backing band. The best duo was Marguerite and UJ O'Neill. And Mark Vincent won best soloist. A highlight of the night was a performance by rising star Billy Wilde. The Alan Brooking Encouragement Award was won by young rock band The Hip Slingers, but all interest was in the announcement of the Newcastle Star Award, shared for the first time between two contestants, DV8 and the Roaring Horns. I'd like to have my photo taken with uh, Daryl and Tommy. The authority will introduce compulsory registration for all boxers and others involved in the industry and will replace the previous controls introduced in 1980. Its chairman will be Sydney solicitor Terry Hartman, medical officer Lou Lewis and police licensing officer Ken Bunyan. 
Newcastle's Clive Greedy, John McDougall of Sydney and former boxing champions Trevor Christian and Paul Moore make up the board. The new authority will be responsible for the appointment, training and grading of referees and judges and will create a single rating system and a single set of rules for all contests. It will require every boxer to enter a contract before fighting regardless of how much money is involved. Titles will be controlled by the authority, which will sanction title fights, declare titles vacant where appropriate, and set times for defence of titles. The Act also has ramifications for the yeah, amateur like side of the sport hands as much and as for kickboxing. Uh, this it also excludes women from boxing well. and Your kickboxing. Old Zen and Goronsky is a, is a possible... was worse than yesterday. While riots in South Africa continue, the situation Thousands is kept of under tight rampaged through Kwandabule, and once again it was the homes of government-appointed officials that Two received their attention. This home. In the country. The African National Congress and but there the were signs too Congress. that the arson and looting Although had become more indiscriminate, with private vehicles set alight and shops destroyed. And Castalia Maloko is a member of the PAC, which has its headquarters in exile in Tanzania. Travelling across Australia, Castalia says she's spreading news of the bloodshed and is asking the government to impose sanctions to weaken the South African economy and strengthen the rebels' fighting capacity. But she says sanctions alone will not free her people. It will definitely come to an end, uh, but only through Amstrada. You see, sanctions are good, they are going to help to an extent, but they are secondary to the principal method being waged by our people inside the country. Our people are fighting against colonialism, and this they cannot just achieve through sanctions. It's only through armed struggle that they will at least uh, achieve their cherished goal, that of liberating our motherland, Azania. Hello, I'm Janelle Provost. On tonight's news, I'll bring you a report on the first day of a two-day conference of the Australian Pensioners Federation. They say that the Labor government isn't doing enough for them. And in fact, Labor Party policies are eroding their standard of living. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. conference in trades hall that these pension well, representatives well, are angry. They say that despite well, numerous promises, they are worse off under the first time government than they've ever been. We're not operating out of a, a secretary's of home. To be that's very important. That's these include full pension fringe benefits for all people over 70, regardless of other incomes, bringing the married pension in line with the single payment, and perhaps the most important issue of increasing pensions to 30% of the average weekly earnings. Christian, I wake up and say, well, you know, is he really gone? Well, I believe that the pack got um, and I think whether it's, whether it's difficult or not, we indeed have to do it. That's the important question. That if we're going to get any relief uh, and any economic justice for uh, people on welfare, it's going to have to be done. And we're going to have to indeed double our efforts. That's essentially what I said in my report, that we really are going to have to put pressure on some of those, I believe, good people uh, within the Labor Party to have the present policies reversed. Getting down to some of the, the finer issues, what... Mr Morris says the plan proposes how Australia can develop an all-Australian shipping industry to earn money overseas. He says the proposals could help reduce the $5,800 million being spent in foreign countries to carry our imports and exports by sea. The proposals recommend the increased use of efficient, competitive vessels carrying the Australian flag. 
the streamlining of crewing and tax incentives to encourage Australian companies to invest in this industry. The Maritime Industry Development Committee was established to assess the issues raised by an overseas study mission in 1985 and is made up of representatives of all seagoing unions, ship owners and members of the Federal Department of Transport. The report now goes to the Federal Labor Caucus and Parliament before submissions are made to interested parties like shipping lines, farming groups, coal companies and port management. semi-finalists chosen from photographs of more than 200 entrants. The competition is the brainchild of one of Newcastle's best ever models, Katie Botterill, who has been modelling both here and overseas for the last 14 years. The judging panel includes East of Eden star and top model Warren Blondell and Stuart Cameron and Michelle Shalligan from Chadwick's model agency. The panel had the difficult job of choosing 20 models to go into the final on November the 19th. On that night, the winner will be catapulted to a national modelling career, receiving a 12-month contract with Chadwick's. All the money raised goes to the MBN Telethon, in aid of the Hunter Life Education Centre.